Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's workshop where uh, we will be talking, we will be looking at the evolving contours of online extremism and uh, preventing and countering violent extremism in the context of Sub-Saharan Africa. And today we have a diverse panelists that are going to, uh, they focus on different regions of Africa. So we have uh, a panelist from the region of West Africa, and then we have Eastern Horn of Africa. And then we also have a panelist from the region of South, uh, South Africa, or rather uh, Southern Africa as a whole. And uh, the idea for this particular workshop came from uh, conversations that we've been having at uh, Voxpol Network and also the Cyber Threats Research Center where we feel um, there's a lot uh, of conversation around violent extremism and violent extremism is actually a big problem in the continent, but most of the time we rarely have uh, experts coming from the context of Sub-Saharan Africa to actually participate in the conversation. So today we are really happy to have you. And also again, thank you to all the participants for attending. And uh, the format of the workshop will be 15 minutes for the speakers to do their, pre their presentations. And then at the, at the end, we'll have about um, 20 minutes for questions and answers, but please, for the audience, feel free to use the chat function and the Q&A to just uh, post your questions as we keep on going. So, um, Without further ado, we are going to start with our first speaker, Professor Christy van der Westhausen, who's an author, academic, political analyst, and award-winning media columnist. She currently works as an associate professor heading the research program at the Center for Advancement of Non-Racialism and Democracy at Nelson Mandela University of South Africa. She has uh, published two monographs and also co-edited the Routledge International Handbook of Critical Studies in Whiteness. Thank you and welcome, Professor Christy. Thank you so much uh, to Miraj and, and uh, to Stuart for the invitation to be with you here today. Um, I'm looking forward to, to this workshop. I think um, it's very important to bring African voices in uh, on, on this topic. And uh, so I want to congratulate you also with, you know, with uh, for doing that and actually making making audible the work that's happening in the African context. So um, I'm going to be approaching extremism uh, as a form of politics that's aimed at radically changing a given status status quo, um, frequently through a nostalgic uh, reversion to a previous re regime of power, or the hope to reinstate some previously hegemonic power block or with some utopic future dispensation uh, in mind. You have disaffected elites seeking to mobilize actual or imaginary politically disempowered or disenfranchised sections of the population. Extremists usually have the ideology of nationalism in common. So the view is frequently simultaneously to the past and the future, projecting a better future based on a, on a glorious past. So if we look at current forms of extremism, uh, extremism in South Africa, they frequently take shape through populism. So you have an attempt to constitute a people based on, on grievance due to actual or perceived exclusion from opportunities and, and resources. And with populism, as we know, there's always the tension between the elite and the masses. And you have leaders who are purporting to confront an entitled or corrupt elite on behalf of a noble people who represent the true nation. So our topic today is specifically around how extremists are using online channels. And you know, while the argument has been made that extremism is not per definition violent, I think that the concern for me is definitely with violent extremists or extremists that regard violence as a valid political method. So I will discuss recent examples where the nefarious use of social media have been successful in contrib contributing to public violence. And I'll also uh, share an example where it's not been successful. The invitation to speak today did not um, specify whether we are approaching extremism as specifically of the right-wing variety. And we, we can definitely have a further discussion about the ideological um, dimension to it. But my, my concern is particularly with anti-democratic extremism. I think because South Africa is such a young democracy, um, next year will be 30 years. 
And um, so I'm, I'm uh, concerned about extremism that rejects the values of democracy and um, particularly the right to life, freedom of association and so forth, equality before the law and so on. And then also extremism that seeks to undermine the institutions and processes of democracy, um, the courts, uh, legislative representation, elections and so forth. The, the question of difference becomes pertinent when you um, look at the nation, nationalist dimension to most extremisms. So again, the concern with an anti-democratic drive would be also an exclusivism and, and um, sometimes even a murderous intent uh, in relation to race, ethnicity, nationality, also an assertion of gender and sexual norms that seek to bind women um, unequally into these racially or ethnically defined um, collectives. So of course, when we think of South Africa, we, we uh, immediately think of the white right and, uh, and this makes a lot of sense, of course. We know that uh, uh, this, the system of apartheid was an elaboration of, of colonialism. It was particularly a white supremacist system. And, um, but I am going to be talking today about um, something that's recently, there's been a recent shift in scholarship in, in South Africa. We were trying to make sense of a reactionary politics that's emanating from powerfully, um, or politically powerful black actors. Uh, I've just published an article in, in Africa Today actually on the fascistic um, overtones of the politics of, of the economic freedom fighters. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but, but first, before I get to that, let me speak to a recent failed white right uh, example where, um, where social media uh, was particularly used. And I'm talking about somebody who called himself the leader of the National Christian Resistance Movement. His name is Harry Knussen. He was last year sentenced to two life sentences and, and, and um, further punishment for attempting to mobilize a coup using WhatsApp. And uh, it was reported that he had cells across uh, the northern parts of the country, but ultimately only two other, other people were sentenced with him. He, and this, um, he, was, he was sentenced in terms of the Protection of Constitutional Democracy Against Terrorism and Related Matters Act, uh, POCDADARA. I don't know if, if anybody ever uses the acronym, but there it is. Um, and the, 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 um, this, this is a law that was passed in 2004. I know that in this workshop, we also want to look at, at policies and legislation and so forth. And uh, so he was um, found guilty in relation, in relation to this act for incitement to carry out terrorist attacks, uh, soliciting support, recruitment of persons, unlawful possession of a firearm, and so forth. His co-accused, two brothers, were also um, similarly um, uh, sentenced and um, also for unlawful possession of, of ammunition and so forth, all in terms of, of this protection of constitutional democracy against terrorism and related matters act. Um, so, so that's the, uh, the, the failed white right, recent white right example. Uh, he particularly uh, sent um, inflammatory messages via WhatsApp, and uh, it, it was it was clearly not. Even though he called himself the leader of a movement, um, it's it's um, totally unclear who who this movement would have consisted of, because there were only two other people who were ultimately associated with this. And um, his, his call on, on people to step out, um, on white people specifically to step out and, and uh, violently attack black people uh, went completely unheeded. So um, when we look at, at uh, South Africa's the year, in, in the year 2021, we see that this is a threshold moment in the advance of, of populist extremism. So I want to talk about the xenophobic campaign and violence of Operation Dudula and also the July 2021 outbreak of public violence in the economic center of the country, uh, Gauteng, uh, linking into the coastal province KwaZulu-Natal, where our most significant ports are. Um, there's a, it's an economic artery that, that runs between these two provinces that are, um, that's, that's, that's essential to the South African economy. So Dudula is particularly uh, known as a xenophobic campaign. The word Dudula is, is a word in Zulu meaning push out. 
it launched its first major action just a month before the public violence of July 2021 in Soweto, Johannesburg, uh, in, jo in Johannesburg. And, um, and with the Gula, basically what we saw was the use specifically of various uh, social media platforms. Mm -hmm. We had um, the use of, of Facebook, we had the use of Twitter and so on. And it, it followed an earlier campaign that was started with the hashtag put South Africa first. And it's interesting here to notice a link with the South African Defense Force because it turned out that the put South Africans first, first hashtag was actually popularized by somebody with the name Sufiso Jeffrey Gwala. He was a Lance Corporal uh, with um, uh, SA Infantry Battalion in KwaZulu Natal. He was masquerading on Twitter uh, on, as a woman called Lerate Pile and followed by something like 80 fake accounts. So Dudula was actually building on this and actually used, quite successful in terms of circulating flyers on social media um, in, in June of 2021 and instigating violence uh, in that way. And, there's a, and then a month, well, and a, uh, just a few weeks later, actually, we then had the conflagration of, of massive public violence to the extent of which South Africa has, has never seen either in the apartheid era or, or afterwards. And we had uh, for nine days between the 8th and the 17th of July in KwaZulu Natal and Gauteng, as I mentioned, violence uh, that included looting and sabotage, arson and so forth. More than 350 people died and we had damage of about 2.8 billion euro. So um, an expert panel was appointed to, to look into this violence, to, to investigate. And it was actually found that not only was the violence carefully orchestrated in the run up to, to these events, but it was largely enabled by social media. The, um, it's interesting that there's a figure also that links Dudula that was started the month before um, and, and the July uh, 21 violence. And this is a person called Nkhlaatla Lux Dlamini, uh, a, a very charismatic figure who emerged as the leader of, of Dudula, uh, featuring on, um, on his Twitter account, uh, shooting a, um, a firearm and uh, uh, he issued a video called Make Soweto Great Again. We can see the Trumpist um, influence there. Um, you know, images of him in military camouflage and so forth and so on. Uh, and that was actually part of, of, his, of, of the Dudula launch, which happened, you know, as I said, and, and was strongly instigated through uh, social, uh, social media. And he then made a reappearance as a defender of a, a shopping mall in Soweto a month later in the July um, violence. So the July violence, um, just to home in a bit more on it, we, we actually had a situation where there was a complete failure of, of intelligence, even though there was a, a, a ratcheting up of, of messaging um, in the run up to this violence. It followed the arrest of Jacob Zuma, the former South African president, for failure to appear before a committee called um, the uh, Judicial Commission, Commission into uh, allegations of, of um, state capture. And uh, after, his, uh, after his arrest, um, you had this massive conflagration. So we saw the use of WhatsApp there, um, various WhatsApp groups, the Queenie's shutdown, referring to Durban, Free Zuma shutdown. And, and another uh, one that refers to the areas of Inanda and Tuzuma and Komashu and so forth. In terms of the people who were active on these WhatsApp groups, uh, these included employees of the municipality, these included members of the African National Congress who are active in, in um, local ward structures, relatives of, of Jacob Zuma, um, a member of, uh, of the South African National Defense Force yet again, Zuma's daughter, Duduzile Zuma Sambudla, was also uh, involved and um, uh, use in, in using social media. 
We had celebrities uh, involved in using social media, including a, uh, an employee of um, the, um, the Zulu National Zulu radio station, which is the largest uh, radio station in, in, uh, in South Africa, who is, uh, who's, uh, who's quite a celebrity and, and you know, a popular um, host. So uh, quite a bit of fake news used in, in the process, including posting old videos of previous events, trying to create the impression that, that there was a larger um, uh, conflagration that, than, than, than what was really the case. And the violence was also spread from KwaZulu-Natal to Gauteng through the use of social media, with um, some social media posts being circulated asking Gauteng, where are you, and, and so forth. Um, it is interesting to see that social media were also used to intimidate the police, and that's been partly blamed for the, uh, for the bad uh, or, or, the, or the inadequate response of, of the police. And it was also indicated that there was such a flood of messages on, on social media that the police could not properly um, respond. The flip side is, is however, that due to the uh, poor response from, from authorities, um, people um, and communities and businesses and so forth had to find ways to protect themselves and you, social media were actually used to make that um, possible. So the backdrop to all of this, of course, is, and people will probably be aware of this, the um, disgraced British PR firm Bell Pottinger launching a, um, a, a, a campaign on Twitter um, that was basically aimed at instigating racial tensions uh, in South Africa. That's been such a big um, success that many of the terms that were actually launched through that, through that campaign on, on Twitter are uh, still used as part of the everyday political parlance in South Africa, including ra radical economic transformation and white monopoly capital. And this is actually also part of the state captures linked to the state ca capture project and Jack, uh, Jacob Zuma's implication in that. So just to finish off, and I'm running out of time, um, there's some features um, that I've identified in the social media driven extremism in South Africa, which make prosecution um, very difficult. In the first place, it's part and parcel of factional infighting in the ruling African National Congress. It involves state security services who are abusing access to state intelligence and who are purposefully spreading um, fake news. It forms part of the state capture project. And for people who are not aware of, uh, of what this refers to, it's basically a repurposing of state institutions uh, to redirect rents away from development and into the hands of a power elite that intentionally operates in extra legal and anti-constitutional ways. This is a definition from a state capacity uh, research project. The term democracy capture, I think is also quite useful to understand this kind of destructive uh, elite manipulation that one is seeing here where social media has come in um, very, very handy. You see the uh, abuse of, um, of democratic politics. You see a distortion actually of democratic politics because the right of access to information and of freedom of speech and so forth are actually abused um, exactly against um, democracy and to undermine democracy. Um, in the q and I can talk a bit more about um, our Cyber Crimes Act 19 of 2020 and, and any other questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Christie. That was very insightful. And uh, we're going to immediately move to the East and Horn of Africa regions. And first we'll have Dr. Halkano Abdiwario, who is a senior lecturer in religious studies at Egerton University. And he is also the associate director of the Center for the Study of Terrorism, Violent Extremism and Radicalization at the Horn International Institute for uh, Strategic Studies. Dr. Halkano has uh, published extensively with his most recent uh, co-authored book chapter being Framing the Soup, a comparative analysis of uh, a counterterrorism operation in Kenya called Usalama Watch and in Kenya's print media. So Dr. Halkano, over to you. Hey, thank you so much, Miraj. Um, and I'm extremely glad to be invited to this discussion. So. I'll speak about uh, Eastern Africa, but generally concentrate on uh, uh, violent extremism as experienced within the experience of Al-Shabaab and uh, uh, Islamic State uh, affiliates in the region. 
So I'll do a small uh, overall mapping of the key violent extremist groups that are operational in the region. So uh, the main one is Harakat al-Shabaab uh, al-Mujahideen, popularly known as al-Shabaab. It's been in operation since mid uh, the year 2000. It's very active, controls uh, large territories in South and Central Somalia. It's also very active in Somalia cities. Uh, it's been an affiliate of Al-Qaeda, which is this global um, terrorism network that has been in existence for some time. Affili um, so it's been affiliated of Al-Qaeda since 2012. So as a group, it controls territories. At the moment, the group is under immense uh, pressure uh, from uh, Somali National Army, the Africa Union uh, transmission mission in Somalia at MIS, and the uh, international community through, led by the US uh, attacks uh, through drone. And it's, it's believed to have fighting force of between 7,000 to 12,000 and so on and so on. But largely, one thing that stands very, very um, important for us as a region in, in, in this Eastern Africa region is there's quite a number of foreign fighters drawn from Kenya, from Tanzania, from Ethiopia, and other, other, other countries in the region. As a, as a group, uh, which is not just a violent extremist group at the moment, it, it really passes as a, a governance actor because it controls territories. It aspires to establish an Islamic theocracy in Somalia. Its main ideology is, uh, quote unquote, the Salafi jihadism ideology that has very strong understanding of how the society should be structured. Other groups that are also active in the region is Islamic State in Somalia, also referred to as Wilayat al-Somal or Abna uh, al-Khalifa. It's a very tiny group of uh, probably a few hundreds operating in the mountain regions of Puntland, but very active again uh, in Mogadishu and other cities. One thing that also quite um, makes it very visible as a group is there's been an ongoing um, control uh, between Al-Shabaab and, 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 uh, and Islamic State in Somalia over, over, over who, is, who is the main uh, violent extremist group in the region. So who, who, who controls a large number of people. So the, there's been a lot of conflict between these two groups over, 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 over time. Other groups that I also may speak about is Alliance Democratic Force, also an affiliate of Islamic State. It's, it's referred to as Islamic State in Democratic Republic of Congo. It has a uh, fancy name of Madina Tul, uh, Tawhid wa Mujahideen. It operates in North Kivu, Ituri province of Eastern uh, DRC. Originally, the group comes from uh, uh, Uganda. It wanted to establish also an Islamist uh, government in Uganda, but it found refuge in, in uh, Eastern part of uh, DRC with hosts of other rebel groups that are active in this region. At the moment, again, the group is uh, facing a lot of counterinsurgency, um, kinetic activities from Uganda's uh, UPDF. And again, just like Al-Shabaab and IS, there is quite a large number of foreign fighters uh, from DRC, from Uganda, from Rwanda, from Tanzania, and recently even from Kenya. The last of the group that are very active in the region is Ansaru Sunna. Uh, also called Islamic State in Mozambique, an affiliate of uh, Islamic State since 2019. It's been a group that's active in Cabo Delgado and in northern parts of Mozambique. So this is the first group that has this very strong jihadist ideology in Southern Africa. So because of its, um, its, its activities over the last couple of years since 2017, there's been quite considerable military effort from the Southern African countries to try to address the problem of, um, of, uh, of IS in Mozambique. And again, foreign fighters from Uganda, foreign fighters from Tanzania, foreign fighters from other parts of the region are part of it. Why I'm mentioning um, these foreign fighters as very key in understanding the online contours of violent extremism in the region is the aspect of multilinguality when groups like this try to recruit, try to mobilize, try to uh, legitimize their activities and also discredit the activities of the government in the region. So I'll start with, um, with again, Al-Shabaab. And I'll speak a little bit about the context at the moment. So 2012, 2022 has been one of the most violent years as far as Shabab violence is concerned. So uh, statistics from Africa Center for Strategic Studies in a recent report indicate that there's been 133% increase in the level of fatalities linked to this group. And uh, deaths that have been mentioned, uh, have been, I mean, um, last year is up to 6,225, which is, uh, much more than combined level of fatalities in 2020 and 2021. And the first question would be, why was last year much more violent than the other year? Was it because uh, the group had much more capacity than before? But that has to do with the counterinsurgency effort that have been going on since uh, the coming to uh, power of the current president of Somalia, Hussein Sheikh Mahmoud. 
So we'll, we'll, we'll get back to it, but generally this is the context to which when we refer to violent extremist group uh, in the region, we need to understand. These groups pose considerable level of uh, um, instability, not just to Somalia, but also to Kenya, where quite a number of attacks, high attacks have been carried out, but again, continuously low level insurgency level attacks along the borders with Somalia. So when you look at Al-Shabaab and its use of, um, of media, especially online media, a couple of things always stands out. As a group, it's very it strategizes to use both online and offline uh, strategies and as far as reaching out to its potential uh, recruits, its sympathizers, and also to use it as a form of mobilization uh, for purpose of finance and so on. So Al-Shabaab has been known to run a considerable number of uh, media outlets, one of which is referred to as uh, Katai Media Production, which has been in operation since the group has been, um, has, has been in, in force. But one thing that again stands out as far as Shabab is concerned is this element of multilinguality. So uh, in all, in all uh, uh, audiovisual uh, virtual materials that are often produced by groups like uh, Shabab, Somali language for the Somali audience, Swahili language for the Swahili audience in Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Eastern DRC and so on, is one of the key things that has been able to allow it to operate quite um, uh, considerably. Arabic, English, and also minority languages that are targeting other communities in, in the larger Horn of Africa, for instance, in Amharic and others. And overall, as a group that uh, aspires to create certain form of governance in Somalia, it, 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 it uses this media to give a version of events that have occurred. Say when there's an attack in Somalia and, um, and against them or by them, they will try to rationalize by producing a specific uh, virtual material that are often circulated by its sympathizers within social social media network. And again, these materials are used for recruitment purposes. It, it creates these alternative narratives that are, are used to give another reality to what has happened. But over, overall, it tries to discredit regional government, specifically for Al-Shabaab being a very nationalist uh, movement. It discredits the government in Mogadishu, the federal government as corrupt, as a representation of uh, the, the West, as a, as a, as a post-it and other forms of um, delegitimizing terms. Overall, as a group, Shabab has been known to use very key social media platforms like Twitter, like Facebook, YouTube, Telegram, but again, other decentralized messaging uh, platforms such as uh, Element um, uh, and, and, and uh, Rocket Mail and others, and of course, WhatsApp. And this offers for such a group inscription that allows for one on person-to-person -person communication without being surveilled by, by very keen state institutions in the region. And again, as I mentioned, the target audiences of audiovisual materials that are produced virtually by Al-Shabaab is local population in Somalia, and so or regional population within the largest Eastern Africa, but also diasporic Somali population across. And again, other, other also affiliates uh, may join out of the audiences that are, are at the international level. As a group, whenever, uh, uh, they, they run these social media accounts, duplicate accounts are often created. And this comes back to one question that I'll again address towards the end is the element around, around moderation when you look at social media accounts. How good are uh, these tech uh, companies in, in removing hate speech, in removing violent extremist contents, in removing materials that are uh, literally publicizing uh, atrocities that are, communic communicate, uh, are done by this group from, from, from the virtual platform. And I, th I think this is one key area that appears to be very key in when, when, we look, when one looks at um, how Al-Shabaab uh, Islamic State in the region uses uh, social media accounts. Because whenever accounts are banned, often they reappear with exactly similar profiles. And this definitely shows gaps in moderation. And again, sometimes groups, uh, dupe the moderation by using logos of uh, international media media companies like Netflix or Amazon Prime so that moderators when they see the, the, the key things that are the key icon that are posted on it doesn't necessarily immediately lend itself as a content of Al Shabaab. but overall the contents often call for anti-democratic um, uprising against the region against the government it calls for violence against the secular state against leaders against security agents it literally calls for dismantling of the current regimes in the region, which are seen to be an Islamic uh, studios of the West. And therefore, it tries also to ride on, uh, on, on these historical injustices that are specifically uh, purportedly carried out or real or imagined within the region, especially against the Muslim population 
in the larger Eastern Africa region. So it tries to create itself as a savior uh, alternative to the regimes that are existing in the region. And again, finally, the social media accounts uh, that are, 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 are right, written on by, by this group uh, often labels it itself as media outlets. So they, they create, groups like this create media accounts that are not necessarily linked to them, but purportedly as independent media companies. So groups like Shabab have been able to study social media uh, networks perfectly so as to be able to use alternative way of dissemination of their agenda that bypasses ways of moderation that are already existing out there. Uh, it's been, Shabab has been able to use also Swahili online magazines before, but the last issue was in 2017. And, and this is one of the many uh, uh, interactive uh, online magazines that are produced by, by groups like that. But overall, aside from the online platforms that allows them to recruit, to, to delegitimize, to discredit government, it all again relies uh, on intricate face-to-face, peer-to-peer kind of network in terms of uh, allowing it to, to continuously use the online ecosystem for itself. There was a report uh, re uh, released by Institute for uh, Strategic Dialogue um, last year, which looked at how Al-Shabaab has been able to use platform such as uh, um, Facebook for purpose of dissemination of the agenda. And, and the report really carries this strong understanding that moderation is one of the areas that are, is, is a miss, is, is a gap in understanding how this group operates online and how governments have not been able to control its, uh, its activities. So uh, recently, the, 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 the fact that the government has been trying to uh, take over the lands from Al Shabaab in South Central Somalia, in, in other regions within Somalia. There's been concerted efforts by the government also try to cut off the online platform that has been used by Al Shabaab. So the government in Somalia, uh, for instance, banned uh, media uh, you know, handles that have been associated with, uh, with Al Shabaab and declared that if anyone, of, if, the need, if the journalists are part and parcel of this publicity for the, for, for the Al Shabaab, they are liable to to be punished. So, so in the end, the group was um, the group's fought over 40, uh, 40, 40 media accounts from so from Twitter, from Facebook were were banned. Uh, the, some te some television stations were were closed. Some uh, ten news outlets that have been associated with them have been have have been banned. So we see uh, considerable effort, for instance, made within Somalia by the governments try to address the online uh, uh, propaganda machine that often allows a group like Al Shabaab to flourish. But again, when you look at all the other three affiliates of IS, that is Ansar Usuna in Mozambique, uh, Alliance Democratic Force in, um, in, in Eastern DRC, and also, and also the, 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 Mozambican, uh, the Mozambican affiliate, all the three appeared not to have very, um, in-depth understanding of how to use the online ecosystem within their own uh, within their own limited presence, but they often ride on uh, the propaganda machinery of uh, Islamic State, such as Amak News Network, Al Naba um, Newsletter. So they they rely on the global um, Islamic uh, State media platforms in order to publicize their activities. So unlike Al Shabab, they still try to mimic uh, what has been done by Shabab as far as online presence and online contours are concerned. But at the same time, we do not see uh, similar uh, organic activities as far as online uh, platform are concerned. How has been the counterterrorism uh, PCV strategies uh, designed to address this? Uh, again, if you look at the whole Eastern Africa and the larger Horn of Africa, the PCV landscape or the counterterrorism landscape is varied. And so some countries have better capacity to disrupt, to pull down contents, and they even have legal tools to prosecute those who circulate such contents online. A key example, I think, is Kenya, where if individuals are found to be circulating materials that are considered to be jihadist in nature, then they are liable to a specific number of uh, years behind. But if it's proved that they do did possess such such contents, again, uh, countries like Kenya have have been a regional hub for tech tech giants. So and so they have a lot of um, local entities that are working with social media houses 
like Facebook and so on, in terms of moderation and so on. One of the key areas that some of the countries in the region have been able to do is to be able to work with the tech companies in order to address uh, the, the growing presence of Swahili-related uh, jihadist material online. But by and large, uh, the countries in the region differ in terms of legal tools they have, also ability to have capacity to work with tech companies in order to pull these uh, resources, these jihadi resources uh, down. So if I could sum up uh, towards the end, what are the key challenges that are, are being faced in the region as far as um, uh, online, uh, online jihadi materials are concerned? And one, of course, boils down to the gap in moderation on social media platforms. So enormous materials are often produced by various citizen groups. And the contents are circulated uh, viewed by hundreds and hundreds of people, uh, recirculated by the same uh, sympathizer network. And so groups like uh, companies like Facebook, uh, YouTube, Twitter, and so on, have very few personnel to be able to keenly listen or, or view some of this content in order to classify it as violent extremist material and to pull it down. So, so much content always finds its way into the social media networks and, and, and thereby, you know, perpetually. Um, continuously promoting VE materials online. Again, most countries in the region also lack uh, very comprehensive counter disinformation strategies. So what, what is very much lacking in terms of the state's capacity is ability to monitor, to disrupt, uh, and also to pull down contents without also infringing on individuals' uh, freedom to have access to information. So when you, we have this mix between uh, low moderation levels with lack of capacity within most of the government, then we have a very fertile, material, fertile environment for circulation of V material. So I think one of the uh, ways in which this could, could be addressed is if this moderation system within social media uh, platforms are better done in collaboration with other actors in the society who understands this material better. And I'll stop at that uh, Mirage and probably I'll welcome when the question and answer session is uh, on. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Halkano. That was really insightful and it actually fits in with um, uh, Professor Christopher Anzalon's own work, because I think he has done a lot of work on Al Shabaab uh, media warfare and their online strategies. So uh, uh, Professor Christopher Anzalon is a research assistant professor at the Middle East Studies Program at the Krulak Center at Marine Corps University. And uh, he is also an adjunct professor of history and government at the George Mason uh, University. And uh, he has published extensively on social, me uh, on social movements, political violence and terrorism. And like I said, he has a lot of work on um, Al-Shabaab media and information operations. And his recent article was on framing insurgency and rebel protostate, Al-Shabaab's media information and uh, uh, operations. So welcome, Professor Christopher. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm glad to join um, everyone on the panel. So I, I'm, I think a lot of what I'm going to uh, say is uh, sort of meshes well with what Dr. Wario has has covered. Um, the one one of the key things I think to underline is that Al Shabaab, the the that the online and the on the ground sort of operational and, and media strategies of Al-Shabaab, I'll speak specifically about Al-Shabaab, but I'm happy to, to talk about Islamic State uh, affiliates as well in the Horn um, in the Q&A, but that the, their on the ground and their online digital media campaigns and operational sort of activities work in tandem so that there is a sort of cross uh, utilization and a cross fertilization. So for example, uh, after the the January 2020 attack on Camp Simba in, in Kenya, the group used materials that were released digitally also in events that it held on the ground with local populations in Somalia, for example. So the origins of Al-Shabaab's media operations, um, you know, date back to at least early 2007, if not before. There are some sort of proto, what I call proto Al-Shabaab uh, materials that were released in, in later, sort of late 2006, that were not explicitly branded as Al-Shabaab materials, but are very, very similar to the early branded Al-Shabaab products that come out, begin coming out in 2007. So Al-Shabaab from the beginning, from 2007, 2008, you know, wants to construct this sort of rebel sort of proto-state or sort of insurgent state that Dr. Wario mentioned. It, it wants to eventually, of course, take over 
all of Somalia. And for, for them, Somalia is not just the modern nation state, but but they they play off of or play into and, and sort of endorse this idea of a greater Somalia that basically all of the Somali ethnic majority regions, uh, which are now separated into a number of countries in the Horn, that this was something like in, in the Levant was something that was imposed by foreign powers, colonial powers, and that eventually uh, their sort of Islamic state should encompass first all of the Somali ethnic regions. And this is where there's an interesting play between sort of nationalism or greater nationalism, sort of this pan-Somali nationalism, and also sort of the Salafi jihadism, which eventually after that, they talk about a caliphate. But from the very beginning, so Mukhtar Robo, who's now a minister in, in President Mohammed's government, um, you know, in, in an Al Jazeera interview, Al Jazeera Arabic interview in 2007, I believe, was asked about this, you know, you, you talk about a, a, a caliphate and that al-Shabaab wants a caliphate. And he said, you know, first we want to, um, imp you know, implement our governing system in Somalia. And then after that, then we, you know, we can think about something larger than that, a caliphate or a sort of a transnational sort of pan-Islamic, pan-Muslim state. It, as Dr. Wario mentioned, presents itself as this alternative to the internationally backed government, the federal government, uh, first the TFG and now the, the Somali federal government, that it is able to either meet or outperform the government in a wide number of areas. Um, key among them are, are sort of the running of courts and, and justice provision that basically if you have a dispute and you need over land, over resources, over some other personal matter, that they have a system in place, a legal system that is capable of not only adjudicating that dispute, but also then enforcing the verdict. So, which is something that the federal government is still trying to construct. It's something without drawing sort of too many parallels is something that we saw also in Afghanistan, um, you know, 10 plus years ago, that the Afghan Taliban in regions that it controlled were running these kinds of systems that locals would go to, even locals from government controlled areas, which we also see in Somalia, where people in Mogadishu, for example, or in the outskirts of Mogadishu, which are areas um, you know, ostensibly under control of the, the federal government, will still go to an al-Shabaab court, particularly for civil matters, um, just because it's available, even if they don't like al-Shabaab, even if they don't support al-Shabaab, that it, it's much more of a sort of a practical and mechanical um, decision rather than an ideological one. So in 2008, you know, 2007 Al-Shabaab's videos tended to be sort of very sort of brief, kind of a lot of emphasis on sort of suicide bombers, sort of their, their what they call martyr wills, basically their last testaments before they went and launched an attack, carried out a, a terrorist attack. In 2008, as Al-Shabaab on the ground begins to transition and begins to build up these governance structures, sort of naming sort of shadow governors of the different regions, setting up offices of uh, you know, charity collection or zakat collection, setting up courts, setting up sort of domestic security police, if you will, in quotation marks, that their media began to highlight these aspects of the group in addition to the insurgency, uh, you know, military attacks in Mogadishu against the African Union forces, against Somali government forces and sort of allied uh, clan forces. So there is a, an emphasis on in the media on governance in this you know this contest over legitimacy over who is is more authoritative and can actually deliver certain services or do certain tasks, whether that's justice provision or social services, you know, aid distribution, things like that. So the media as the media apparatus of Al Shabaab, you know, which is very multi sort of multi layered and multi faceted, includes domestic and domestically aimed and regionally aimed and transnationally aimed components really focused on narrating sort of al-Shabaab's territorial expansion and control, you know, beginning in 2008 and continuing through, uh, it still does that today, but continuing on to 2010. In, in 2011, you know, there is a, a shift when uh, this is the uh, a time when al-Shabaab comes under very significant on the ground battlefield pressures. Um, which I'll talk about in, in just a moment. In, in 2010, sort of to emphasize the importance of media, um, what's now called the Al-Qatab Media Foundation, which before was just called the Media Department, you know, when they changed the name, and the name changed in 2010, uh, in July, I believe, of 2010, yeah, I think is very important because it, it emphasizes something that Dr. Wario mentioned as well, that 
the way that Al Shabaab's leadership wants its media apparatus to be seen as an alternative news source. So it renamed it the Al Kataib Media Foundation, but also it has a sort of a sub wing called the Al Kataib News Channel. And they, the logo itself, if you look at the Al Kataib logo in Arabic, it, it mimics sort of the big satellite television, Arabic satellite television channels like Al Jazeera, for example. So in, in a statement, you know, Al-Shabaab said, quote, the media battle being waged by the Mujahideen is one of the most difficult and the most important part of a war against the Zionist crusader disbelievers. And this has made us as the caretakers of the media jihad, and they emphasize this concept, in the beloved battlefront of Somalia, it has made us to strive hard to develop methods for media warfare and to advance the weapon of jihadi media to report the truth to the people from the battlefields, as well as to broadcast the voice of the Mujahideen to the entire world in, to defend the Muslims who are under attack. So the this promotion of themselves or this sort of self-narration is an alternative news source. What they want, well, a victory for al-Shabaab, um, I would argue, is not to be seen as the most you know, reliable or the most truthful media outlet or narrator of events, but basically for them to convince some of the target audiences that it's a wash, basically that, you know, Al-Shabaab's media units are sometimes, you know, as reliable as more authoritative, you know, whether that's state media or sort of international news media, that it's a wash, that there is no, it's pretty basically that it's a, it's, it's an equal kind of game. So for that, to achieve that, that is a victory for Al Shabaab because it's convinced, you know, it, it's moved away from, uh, you know, just being seen as a propaganda sort of arm, which it is, of course, to being seen as, as at least at times, um, uh, a news source that is can be as reliable in terms of what's actually happening on the ground. We saw that, you know, uh, with a number of attacks, Manda Bay, they went back and forth, Al Shabaab and. Uh, you know, the AFRICOM, US uh, Africa Command, um, in terms of messaging about the attack as it was still going on. We saw that with the Westgate Mall attack and, and others. The uh, There's a number sort of of media campaigns which they've run targeting, um, Dr. Wario can talk more about this, I'm sure, uh, you know, in 2017 about the Kenyan national elections. Uh, women are a, uh, this is not, unique to Al-Shabaab, but women are sort of a focus of um, trying to motivate their supporters sort of to take up arms, that basically that there's a kind of what they call retributive justice or uh, retaliation in kind, it's an Islamic legal term known as kisas, that basically that because Somali Muslim women are being, according to Al-Shabaab, being uh, attacked and being uh, assaulted by foreign forces, by sort of apostate and quotation marks forces, that this is one of the reasons that that Muslim men need to, it's a play on masculinity. And this is something that we've seen from uh, the Sunni jihadi and as well as the Shiite sort of armed uh, Islamist groups in Syria and Afghanistan and others, basically playing on uh, masculinity as a, as a motivator for action. The way that al-Shabaab looks at you know, the region's history is, is I think, also very interesting that it, it, is this, it shows this tension between sort of the nationalist and the sort of very transnational sort of Al-Qaeda style um, ideologies that, that there is a very much, an there's a heavy emphasis on, on Somali nationalism. Um, the figures that they talk about are, are also, many of them are respected and heralded by Somalis who detest Al-Shabaab. So there's a nationalist aspect to their messaging, but there's also a very sort of transnational that's not tied to Somalia, not tied to the Horn of Africa, not tied to Africa at all um, necessarily, that talks about sort of Muslim identity. Um, and there is this tension in Al-Shabaab's media as well as in some of its other uh, non-media discourses uh, and, and thinking about these issues. So just to sort of close talking about sort of the last year uh, almost a year, about a year, um, since the start of the newest sort of round of, of battlefield pressures that Al-Shabaab has found itself uh, facing. Since the summer of 2012, there was a, this grassroots, there's a grassroots sort of mobilization of some uh, militias of local clans, particularly in, in the central part of Somalia, in middle Shabala, in, in Gal Gadud, in Hiran, called the Ma'awasli, that have mobilized against Al-Shabaab. 
the Somali federal government um, is very active, the Somali National Army, in, 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 defend, in, in joining this, uh, you know, this uh, series of offensives against al-Shabaab. And the next stage, what President Mohamud um, has named as the second phase of the uh, operations, we'll, we'll look at uh, sort of the Juba regions and, and other regions in the, the south and the southwest, also aided by Atmos, by Turkey, and by the United States. So there's immense battlefield pressure. What al-Shabaab has done sort of on the ground is to try to circumvent that by making deals with other clans that are not as supportive of this, of this clan mobilization, anti-Shabaab clan mobilization. They have made sort of side deals. They have uh, tried, they have withdrawn. You know, after 2010, al-Shabaab has tended not to have sort of to the death last stands. We saw this in 2011, 2012 to 2014. You know, there was no there was no Mosul basically 2016 like Islamic State had. There was no fight to the death for no particular strategic reason. And instead, what Al Shabaab has tended to do is to make tactical withdrawals and then return. And we've seen this in central Somalia where they they withdraw from areas and then return either once sort of government and allied forces have left or to launch attacks, for example, like they did in October. 2012 on strategic sort of uh, locations, bridges in this case. Um, the media campaign, they face a much more robust and aggressive uh, sort of counter media and information operations campaign from the Somali federal government about what's happening on the battlefield. I think, uh, you know, in my view, this is uh, shows clearly the influence of, of, of Mukhtar Robo that they, they are utilizing techniques that al-Shabaab actually uses itself um, in saying, you know, countering al-Shabaab's claims about what happened, you know, in this battle, what happened in, in this base attack, what's, uh, you know, this this uh, adoption of the, the term kharajait or khawarij, this uh, term from, from this 9th and 10th century uh, sort of set of groups that for Sunni and Shiite Muslims, it's kind of like a boogeyman, it's like the embodiment of everything uh, of extremism, basically, because of, of what the original Kharajites were like. This is something we also saw earlier in 2014, 2015 with Islamic State, ISIS. You know, call them Daesh, call them Kharajites, don't refer to them as, as Muslims because, uh, you know, this, this legitimizes them. So I think that you know, there's a discussion to be had about how, you know, useful or successful that can be. You know, in its media response, uh, Dr. Wario mentioned this sort of uh, implementation by the Somali federal government of stricter rules and regulations about sort of uh, media discourse. Um, I, I'll just mention sort of as a, a thing also that there is a, you know, there's a discussion I think also we had about wh where, you know, how that can be approached without infringing on, uh, you know, free media. So there, the International Committee for the Protection of Journalists, for example, has, has, had, has, met, has had some concerns about how some of these policies have been Implemented, there was also an issue when they, you know, they uh, the government issued a uh, sort of a statement declaration about some of these uh, Al Shabaab affiliated, uh, you know, websites that that you know at least one of those websites, Small Wars Journal, is not an Al Shabaab website. It's actually a, an academic and a, a policy journal, and one that's uh, at least in 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 sort of uh, is fairly prominent. It's a it's a digital journal. So Al-Shabaab has also played off of government claims. So if the government says, you know, the, there's an attack, for example, in January of this year on the Dana uh, base, the Dana base in Galad, in Gal Gadud, that, you know, we repelled Al-Shabaab, but then it seems that Al-Shabaab actually at least temporarily took control of the base. So this, and this has happened repeatedly, actually, just since January of this year. There's been a number of, I think the number is up to six now of, where there is a sort of a tit for tat media uh, battle, if you will, between uh, dueling claims. We captured the base, no, you didn't, we repelled you. Um, the issue with that is oftentimes it's Al Shabaab that seems that releases what they claim to be photographs or video footage that that shows the opposite, oftentimes, which then gels with you know, interviews or, or with local uh, residents, for example. Um, and so I, I'll, I'll close with that, actually. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Anzalon. Um, uh, that, again, was really insightful regarding al-Shabaab media warfare. I think this is something that uh, we often don't get to talk about quite enough. 
And now we're going to welcome Professor Freedom Onwoha. Um, he's a professor of political science at the University of Nigeria. We're happy to have you uh, on board. And he's also the coordinator of security, violence and conflict research group at uh, the University of Nigeria again. He teaches and researches and also consults on diverse aspects of national and transnational security challenges with an emphasis on violent extremism, terrorism, insurgency, uh, maritime security, violent conflict amongst others. He, is, uh, he has co-edited three books, including uh, Security in Nigeria, Contemporary Threats and Responses. So uh, welcome, uh, Professor Onoha. Thank you, Miraj, uh, and I do hope you can hear me. Okay, thank you, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, let me begin by saying that I'm most honored and uh, privileged to be uh, in the midst of these very great panelists who have uh, actually learned uh, from their own interventions. And I, I do believe that the reflections they have made have created, I think, the right context uh, for me also uh, to share my thoughts around uh, how violent extremist organizations uh, tend to use uh, the, the internet for, for, for their operational sustenance and operational successes. For sure, you know that the internet has almost come like a double-edged sword. It has a lot of promise, but a lot of perils uh, for Africa. At the last count, sometime, I think uh, January this year, it is estimated that over 565 million persons in Africa now have access uh, to the internet. Of course, you know, the internet has a lot of great potentials for promoting economic development, uh, including political development as people begin to actively engage with the politics of their nation. However, we have also seen that uh, violent extremist organizations operating in Africa have equally leveraged on the opportunities and the potentials of the internet uh, to expand their recruitment to drive, uh, to propagate their, their ideologies and narrative, also to even recruit members or sympathizers as well as to fund uh, their operation. So uh, just in line with uh, what our previous uh, panelists have also said, I think my reflection will draw extensively uh, from the Nigerian experience, uh, particularly zeroing on in on the activities of, of the Jamal to al Husina leader Watiwa Jihad, uh, which is the group many people know as the Boko Haram. Uh, I will be using the word Boko Haram generally carry, uh, but also sometimes I'll be very specific to let you know that even though the group is known as the Boko Haram, in terms of its history, uh, we have had two uh, splinter groups. Uh, the first splinter group, of course, is one known as the Ansaru, uh, which broke away from the Boko Haram in 2012 following a disagreement around uh, the targeting of certain facilities and individuals uh, in Kano State in Nigeria in 2012. That was a doctrinal uh, disagreement that laid the foundation for Ansaru to break away uh, from the Boko Haram. Then of course, the second splinter group, which again, uh, later emerged as, as the most dangerous and the most uh, um, extensive in terms of its reach, is the one we know as the Islamic State West African province which again is a breakaway faction of the Boko Haram. Again, they broke away from the Boko Haram as a result of doctrinal and tactical differences. But overall, the Boko Haram, as you know, is a violent extremist organization that came to limelight uh, uh, from 2019, following what we call the July 2009 revolt. Uh, in terms of their philosophy, they align neatly uh, with uh, the Al-Shabaab, like what you have mentioned. Uh, they, uh, they subscribe to the Salafi Jihadist ideology, uh, but under the leadership of then uh, leader known as uh, Abu Bakr Shekau, who is now late, uh, they have a particular strain called the Takfirist strain of the Salafi Jihadist ideology. Uh, this Takfirist strain uh, tend to interpret anybody who is not a member of the Boko Haram as, as an infidel, whether you're a Muslim or not Muslim. And I say this point because it is key to understanding why we later uh, had um, the splitting of the Boko Haram on core ideological and philosophical grounds. So essentially, the Boko Haram uh, became a major concern uh, from 2009 when they had uh, reached a major revolt in four states in, 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 in northern Nigeria. But then by 2013, they began to acquire a regional outreach, you know, establishing cells, um, mounting attacks in three other West and Central African countries. So they began to mount attacks in Chad in Cameroon and Niger. And that in itself had prompted a uh, regional coalition in the form of the multinational general task force uh, to respond to the threat of the Boko Haram. And just, just to 
uh, speak one more on that. I think that the, the successes of the multinational joint task force are coupled also with the reintegration of the national forces of the four countries, that is Nigeria, Chad, Cameroon, and Niger, have actually played a key part in substantially degrading the Boko Haram. So uh, from a very strong, effective, and destructive group that was responsible for over 2001 deaths uh, in 2014, the group has first had been actually declared that much of their the death toll that have been attributed to the group is, le is just less than 120 uh, in terms of the terrorism incidents. But having said that, uh, my reflections we focus more on how the Boko Haram, and I said the Boko Haram are making reference to the Ansaru, sometimes the Jamaat al Sunali that was the Jihad, or then the Islamic State West African province. province. So my, my reflection will focus on how uh, they've used uh, internet for, for diverse purposes. And, and I think consistent with the way and manner in which other terrorist organizations have used the internet, and which has also been abundantly brought out uh, by the previous speakers, I think there are at least five key ways uh, or dimensions that we, we can look at the way and manner in which uh, the Boko Haram uh, have used um, in the internet for their own uh, operational successes or advantage. First, of, first is what we mentioned, the use of this for propaganda dissemination. I think that the Boko Haram uh, have really, really enjoyed a lot of uh, sympathy and a lot of uh, attention, given the way and manner in which they have used the internet, particularly, particularly YouTube uh, in the days when uh, Mohammed Shaka was alive. You know, using it, you know, to disseminate uh, its propaganda messages, particularly when Abubakar Shaka will always come out in a video recorded. Um, session to say that they are fighting the Nigerian government because the Nigerian government is corrupt and because the Nigerian government does not reflect the wishes of Allah. And so for the purposes of their, 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 their ideology, they argue that they are trying to provide an alternative government. And this is a government that is not corrupt as he will always put that. So um, when Shakar was alive, he had consistently leverage on those kind of audio and video messages you know, to reach out to a larger audience uh, in terms of casting uh, a narrative of the Boko Haram as a much more reliable, much more legitimate, and much more authentic government uh, again, um, uh, standing against the Nigerian government. Uh, let me just mention one or two things. For example, uh, in 2014, if you recall, when Boko Haram was responsible for kidnapping over 260 school uh, Chibok years, it made the headline news. Even Boko Haram themselves released uh, audio tape uh, through YouTube, uh, showing clips of those those years, some of the years that they have kidnapped, and even threatening in some of those videos that they are going to marry them off, you know, like sex slaves. So this is one of the areas that Boko Haram have uh, leveraged uh, technology, particularly uh, YouTube channels and video, you know, to propagate their agenda, to propagate their own ideology. Another area that people have not also looked extensively on is the way and manner in which this group has leveraged uh, technology uh, for financing its operation. And um, in terms of financing, we are looking at either raising funds or also for wire transferring funds. And I think the most recent of such incidents uh, uh, is the case of where six Nigerians uh, were, were arrested, tried, and convicted by the United States, United uh, Arab Emirates government in 2019, but it came to limelight in November 2020. And uh, six of these guys were actually trying to find guilty of terrorism financing. So they were using Buru to change. Of course, you know, it's an international means of transferring money. They were using Buru to change then uh, to transfer uh, close to 1,000 US dollars, um, close to 100,000 US dollars to, to members of the Boko Haram. So one word whether they get the money from UAE, and they use the Burudu change to funnel it back uh, to Nigeria in order to, to support the activities of the Boko Haram. And so I think it was when uh, these guys were first arrested, tried and convicted that it became almost clearer uh, to the Nigerian government and other discerning minds as to how the Boko Haram is also leveraging uh, the internet for funding its operation. Another interesting area, again, is the way and manner Boko Haram then uses um, such such platforms uh, to publicize its attack. And I think the most horrific of such was the incident of the live beheading of a Nigerian pilot who was captured in 2014. Uh, the Boko Haram shot down his pilot, or shot down his aircraft, and they virtually caught him alive. And he was uh, actually beheaded uh, by, by the Boko Haram. And, and the video uh, made a whole lot of circulation in the internet 
and that created a lot of concern. Uh, and also even the way and manner in which they 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 they, they, they cover their operations. Uh, I recall that in 2015, when they attacked this day, this day is a popular newspaper in Nigeria, when the Boko Haram attacked this day newspaper, uh, they prepositioned a cameraman far from the scene of the incident who actually covered the entire process of the arrival of the suicide bomber, the way he gained entrance in the building, and at the moment of which the explosive went, went forth. So they, they use, they first get this kind of video in order to use it to, for, first of all, you know, uh, propagate uh, their agenda and their ideology. They also use such video uh, to do radicalization in their camp. So it, it serves the purpose of uh, publicizing the attacks, but also the purposes of radicalizing some new recruits who are then uh, subjected to this kind of exhortation uh, in their camps. Of course, communication and coordination is another way, uh, the, the Boko Haram, uh, and in this, in this case, I will, I will mention particularly the ISWAP, the Islamic State West African Province, and the Ansaru uh, have been using uh, social media in particular to enhance their communication and coordination. In fact, uh, as of, as of uh, February this year, it is estimated that the Islamic State West African province have a combined uh, account of it. So over time, what they've also done in most cases is that uh, once the state government and when the federal government tries to shut down any of these accounts, then they tend to create another one. So it is always very difficult to arrive at a static number or the exact number of the accounts these um, groups uh, operate, essentially because as government identifies and disables such accounts, they always migrate to new accounts. And then the last one I will mention is the whole question about their capability to use uh, the internet for cyber attacks. This is something that has not received much attention, but uh, there is a sense of which we can argue that the report of the federal government, which was showing that uh, in 2012, uh, the Boko Haram was responsible for defacing uh, the website of the Nigerian army and the Nigerian Navy. There is claims actually that these websites were defaced uh, by members of the Boko Haram. And people also tend to agree, agree uh, on that, essentially because again, a book, weeks after, the Boko Haram also threatened the Nigerian military and their families to say, look, that they have complete uh, data and information about the Nigerian military and their families where they are located, and they can always launch a reprisal attacks against, against them. So in a sense, I think this is the way and manner in which uh, these terror groups have tried to use um, uh, internet for their purposes, for the purposes of their operation. What has been the response of the Nigerian government? I think in different ways, the, the Nigerian government in particular have tried to respond uh, to the threats posed by violent extremist organization who then use uh, the internet for their operations and, and for their activities. The first, of course, we know is the attempt to disrupt this online propaganda. And again, the Nigerian government, I think, lacks the capacity, the kind of technology that they can easily use to disrupt or to dismantle or even to disable this propaganda. So they usually have to rely, again, on these tech providers like Facebook working you know, behind the scene, drawing their attention to some of, of, of these and asking that they help the Nigerian government to bring it down. A typical example, again, is the one I mentioned in 2014, uh, the beheading of Hedima, who is actually the, the Air Force pilot that uh, Boko Haram captured and beheaded. I think the Nigerian government then had to work uh, with YouTube and then Facebook to ensure <laughs> that that video was taken off. Again, they've also tried to engage in counter-narrative uh, strategy which is where the, the, the Nigerian government have also tried to leverage other means of communicating to the wider public uh, using what they call their CTC center. The CTC center is the counter-terrorism center, uh, which is actually domiciled under the Office of the National Security Advisor. In fact, the, 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 the outgoing administration of President Mohamed Buhari actually upgraded that center to a very large center, brought in a lot of uh, ICTs. And I think those ICT facilities that was brought in uh, and was launched last year, I think this early this year was an attempt, you know, to, to scale up the capability of that center uh, to respond to, to the online activities of violent extremist organizations, because that's actually where the government have not been doing too well, essentially because of our weak technological capabilities. Monitoring of the online activities uh, of terror group is something we know 
uh, at least as someone who has been working in this area and having very close contacts with officials of the Nigerian government. You know, monitoring online activities of this group is something that uh, the Nigerian agency called the DSS. The DSS, of course, is the State Secret Service, the Department of State Services. Uh, the DSS has been tasked, you know, essentially to be monitoring some of these online activities, whether it is proclamations, videos, audios, uh, WhatsApp communication, Telegram communication of uh, these terror groups. So they are the center of watching out to see what is happening online and seeing how they can uh, neutralize that. You can also mention um, legislative response. A lot of persons also who have been arrested in terms of, of the Boko Haram, whether they were using technology to enable the activities or otherwise, I think have also been tried by the Nigerian anti-terrorism law, which was first adopted in 2011, um, um, reviewed in 2013, and again reviewed again in 2021. So it's a comprehensive framework, you know, for prosecuting any acts of terrorism or violent extremism perpetrated uh, by groups. The last one, of course, is what I may call um, counter narratives, not just by the Nigerian government but in the wider context of the Lechard Basin, particularly if you follow the activities of the Radio Dandankura. So the Radio Dandankura uh, is a radio platform in which the affected countries, particularly Nigeria, Niger, Chad, and Cameroon, is using as, as one platform you know, to weave counter narrative against uh, the Boko Haram, because like I mentioned, uh, the Boko Haram have extensive reach in terms of uh, existence and operation in the Lake Chad. And so the Radio Dandakura uh, speaks to the, to, to the citizens of the Lake Chad uh, using at least the, the, the major languages. Here I am talking about French, there's a French version. They also speak uh, in Kanuri language, which is well spoken within the Lake Chad region. They also speak in house, they also use Hausa program. And sometimes also they, they, they speak in English. So the idea is to now ensure that they leverage uh, these local languages uh, to, to, to reach out to a wider audience uh, who are maybe vulnerable or susceptible to the activities, the online activities of this group. So what are the challenges I've seen, you know, monitoring what is happening and what the federal government uh, have been doing in terms of, of responding to the use of the internet by violent extremist organization. First, of course, we know, and I've earlier hinted that, is the fact of limited capacity on the part of governments. Uh, I, 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 maybe apart from South Africa, I don't, and again, to some extent, uh, Kenya, as uh, what you mentioned, I do not think that are African countries that have that tech uh, enablement, you know, that sound, robust tech capabilities to, on their own, dictate, respond, and then dismantle some of these violent extremist contents uh, we are seeing. So they always like to fall back uh, uh, to, to the tech companies, Facebook, YouTube, and stuff like that to help them to respond. Of course, you see the danger uh, in delayed response, which means that some of this content would have gone very far before the, the government uh, gets uh, the, the, the support and assistance of tech companies to respond. Then another challenge again is the whole debate around how do we balance security versus civil liberty. In, in, you know, in the desperation to deal with the threat posed by the violent extremist group, the activities online and offline, we have seen you know, the ratcheting up of police powers, uh, which in itself is already beginning to compromise uh, civil liberties in Nigeria. So there's a whole lot of debate, particularly within the civil society organization, around the question about the shrinking civic space. I think there's some, this something that is very huge, a whole lot of conferences, workshops, and seminars going on, both within the civil society space and even between the civil society actors and, and the officials of the Nigerian government uh, as, uh, in terms of how uh, the development of counterterrorism tools in terms of legislation, in terms of monitoring and surveillance, have tended to shrink uh, the civic space uh, in Nigeria. I, I think that's a major problem. The, the third one I need to also have to measure, me mention is actually the, the problem of uh, poor understanding or good understanding of the relevance of local language, both in terms of the framing and dissemination of local content. And this is where the, 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 the answer we have actually beat both the federal government and the tech uh, companies. In recent times, studies have shown uh, that the answer has extensively leveraged on Hausa language. 
because in terms of the programming of the algorithms, you know, of of, of these tech uh, tech companies, their detection and monitoring algorithms tend to look at things that are in English or in French. And, and, and so when Ansaru discovered this limitation on the part of the government and tech, they have migrated to share more of their content in Hausa language, which therefore means that if we are going to have an effective countermeasures online, then you need to you know, train a lot of persons in this particular language that are a bit not national, so to speak, uh, you may consider as local or dialect, so that it can easily be picked up. So the fact that these tech companies have not designed their monitoring uh, bits, you know, to capture uh, some of these estimate contents that are framed or, or positioned in local language uh, is one that has made it a, a little bit difficult for them to dictate. Then finally, finally, which is also the problem generally in counterterrorism. So the whole idea that we, we would defeat terror groups by fighting them in the same battlefield. So if they, if, if they take their battle to the internet, we join them in the internet. So if they take it offline, we join them offline. So that disconnect between uh, online offline strategy, I think is a major problem in terms of defeating terror groups. We need to realize actually that the, 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 the problem, the seat and the echo chamber of terrorism is at the heart of the individual that is radicalized or is exposed to this extremist content. Therefore, how you have to change their mind should be the locus or the first eye of attention. Trying to defeat them online will not work because these guys really are eager to use the internet. So if we're able to deny them the opportunity of recruiting uh, individuals in the first instance, then we may be very lucky uh, in defeating them in the battlefield of technology. So I think that that disconnect uh, in terms of the way counterterrorism has been framed, that is not in very much holistic and robust manner that integrates both the online and offline uh, into one particular stream that is targeted at winning the hearts and minds of the local population, making them much more resilient against the extremist narratives. Uh, it's where the problem lies in some of these African countries. And again, uh, I think that is part of why we are seeing an overtly militarized response uh, to counterterrorism. So militarized also that is kinetic in the sense that once you see an extremist content, the first line of action is to pull it down. But as we are pulling down one, these extremists are, are uploading tens and thousands of them, which means therefore is actually that the battlefield is not even on the tech ecosystem. I think it's at the heart of, of the people. So I think this is where I'm going to uh, stop now and do hope that I may have opportunity also to, to respond to some other uh, areas, gray areas, should we have participants that are not too uh, clear about some of the issues that I've raised. So thank you so very much and I'm honored to be part of this very great panel. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Unwoha. Um, your presentation actually wraps up really nicely with uh, what had been discussed by Professor uh, Christie, as well as Dr. Halcano and um, Professor Anzalon. So it's quite interesting to see the parallels in the different regions and also in the different country cases between how both um, extremist groups, but also individuals in positions of power actually disseminate content using uh, social media platforms and how best we can think of regulating that. So I think we have one question at the moment from the audience. And uh, this is directed, I, I feel like you've answered the second part of the question, but the first uh, part is uh, for, for freedom. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, the question is from uh, Elizabeth Pearson. And uh, it says, is there less reliance of jihadist online? Um, for example, in the, uh, uh, your examples were pretty historic and linked to him. So in the post Shekau period, is there a reliance on jihadist online activities? If you could uh, elaborate a bit on that. And also, um, um, I think you've answered the second part of the question, but feel free to also expound on it some more. Well, uh, thank you. I'm so happy to hear that the question is coming from a very good friend of mine, Lizzie. We, unfortunately, I think the configuration of the platform is one that we can't see each other. So I'm sure you are seeing me. So thank you once again to connect online. On, online. I think that I have not done a statistical tabulation of the quantity and quantum of online jihadism pre shekau or during shekau era and post shekau era. But I, I, can get, I can hazard some thoughts and those will be in two ways. First, I think that given the tempo of pressure that have been mounted on the Boko Haram generally, you know, and I, I mean, 
the Boko Haram, the Jamaatul al Sunnah that watch Wa Jihad, and the Islamic State West African province. We have seen that they have been denied a lot of space and room uh, that enabled them during the Shekau era, you know, to feel relaxed, to feel safe, to develop and share online content. My first response would be that guessing, I think that we have seen a fundamental reduction in quantity terms. In quantity terms uh, of, of the number of online content that is coming out from this group. But we have also seen a bit of you know, sophistication and refinement in terms of the quality of what has come out in Poshekau. But one area I want to emphasize is the fact that we have seen that going by the level of pressure put on this group, we have then seen that these guys are now beginning to engage in fake news. I think, I think there was a claim uh, by the ISWAP of a major attack in a Nigerian base, military base, I think some, somewhere in, in, uh, in Northern Burundi, and that was earlier this year, where they claimed that, over, that they, they, they overpowered the soldiers in the base. I don't have the name of the base so that I don't misinform audience, but at least it's early this year, where they claimed uh, in a video that they've released in, through Telegram that they overran the base. But after fact checking and then uh, going back and forth, it was proven that that was actually a, a fake video, which means therefore that uh, they have been put on the, on the back foot. And so they, they, they themselves are beginning not just to develop contents that are for propaganda purposes, but they are beginning to forge uh, videos and audio, you know, um, online contents that are, not, that are not genuine as it used to be uh, in the days of Abu Bakr Shekau. So I think my response will be that I think there must be a statistical a drop in terms of the number of online content uh, generated and uploaded by the Boko Haram, and I mean the ISWAP and the JAS uh, in Poshekau era. So Miraj, I don't know what's the second aspect of the question. Oh, sorry, sorry. I thought you could actually see it from your end. So uh, Elizabeth Pearson says, anecdotally, Nigerian CVE practitioners do not normally emphasize um, the online angle in their work in relation to Boko Haram. And I think actually this is true for also the uh, East and Horn of Africa region as well. So she's asking, should online be taken more seriously in Nigeria or does it matter mostly for external audiences and activities? Well, my response going by research, and again, I, I can ask um, uh, Lizzie to get back to me uh, informally. She knows what I mean by that, so that I don't misinform the audience. Uh, in 2000 and, um, 2013, I was commissioned by an NGO to do a work around the activities of Boko Haram in terms of their recruitment strategy, right? And then one of the things that emerged then was that uh, the use of the internet was rated around 3% of the overall recruitment strategy then. That was what we considered the baseline study. That particular organization came back last last two years, because I think I concluded it in 2021. Come back again and said they are doing uh, an end line study. So we use, they use the same tool, administered to the same number of participants and in the same locality. It was shocking that uh, the response showed that uh, Boko Haram recruitment via on internet have moved up to, uh, I think up to 15%. So for me, if, if the findings of those baseline and end line st study, is something to rely on. It means therefore that a lot of recruitment is going on online. And it is, it is tragic to say the least that the Nigerian counterterrorism and countering violent extremism uh, strategy overall, the emphasis or at least less, 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 less low emphasis on, on, on the online dimension of countering violent extremism, which in itself uh, for me is actually very dangerous. It is dangerous in the sense that the, the youth we are having now, even the ones they claim to be in rural areas, are ones that are exposed or connected to the internet because uh, the aggressive penetration of Chinese phones, as we, as we call it, but not being derogatory, but aggressive penetration of Chinese phones in Nigerian market has crashed the price of phones in Nigeria. The result, therefore, is that a lot number of persons, including people, who are staying in rural communities now can procure very cheap phones that enable them connect to the internet. And if that is what is happening right now, it means therefore that a lot of persons are actually being exposed to online contents uh, raised by violent Muslim organizations. 
questions, but the Nigerian government, so to say, have not been following that up. So my sense is that we've had an increase based on what the end and the, uh, the baseline and end line research have shown. Uh, the exact statistics I can't mention again because um, I don't have them here, but it's on my laptop. So it shows that uh, it seems that activity is going on, recruitment uh, via online platforms is going on, and the penetration of uh, internet uh, as a result of the cheapness of a lot of Android phones now would also be an indicator, therefore, that a lot of persons are connecting to the internet, which means also that in a situation where we have very lax control of uh, the internet, like in Nigeria, a lot of persons also are likely being exposed to those violent uh, uh, narratives that are being shared in terms of content by violent extremist organizations such as the Boko Haram. Uh, thank you so much. So uh, before we proceed with the questions and answers, uh, uh, Professor Christie unfortunately has to leave. She has another appointment, but thank you so much for coming on board and your presentation was really insightful. Um, I'm going to uh, send an email after the workshop and then we can further discuss about where we take it from here. Thank you so much, Christy. Thanks, thank you for, for, uh, for the invitation and uh, I found it very interesting to listen to my fellow pa panelists as well. So very good to meet you even if only virtually. So um, hopefully we meet again. Uh, so I think uh, first we'll take uh, questions. There are two questions, one from Ziahan and Olela. So Ziahan, I'm going to allow you to talk and you can uh, ask your question, but uh, let's try to keep it brief so that the panelists have time to expound further. Um, Ziahan, are you there? Okay, so uh, maybe we'll uh, we'll take James's question and then we'll get back to Zia. Uh, thank thank you, uh, Miraj, uh, for this opportunity. And uh, first of all, thank you for uh, coming up with uh, such an esteemed uh, panel on on a very topical matter of discussion and also uh, uh, contributing to the voices, the African voices that are normally a little hard in the PCV space. Uh, mine is a, a question that is directed to the, the panelists and who, whoever can uh, can respond to it. And this is the um, uh, anxieties around uh, uh, artificial intelligence and the opportunities that artificial intelligence can provide vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, 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 acting, what I would say, as a force multiplier to uh, 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 violent uh, extremism through the use of um, of tools uh, that we are. I just wanted to speak to the issue of artificial intelligence within online space and uh, its implications for for terrorism and violent extremism, and um, what uh, they feel should be done about it. Or, or how it can also complement ongoing uh, prevention and counter violent, violent extremism uh, uh, measures that are, uh, are coming up. Thank you. Uh, thank you, James. I think we'll also take the question from Zia and then we can um, uh, answer them that way. So uh, Zia, do you wanna go ahead and ask your question? Uh, yes, can you hear me now? Is that better? Yes, yes. Okay, awesome, thank you. I actually had two questions, but I think I'll just cut it down to one, just noting the time. Um, so my question is for um, Dr. Wario, although um, Professor Anzalona, you can um, also answer noting the overlap in the questions if you feel. Um, so I just note that um, in your presentation, uh, Dr. Wario, that you noted that um, there were some issues from social media companies in moderating um, Al-Shabaab content. Uh, just because that there isn't much resources um, dedicated uh, towards the Sub-Saharan Africa region. And of course, most of the resources from these social media companies are very English language focused, very European. Um, and and obviously, I, I, I mean, I also see this knowing that even in Australia, I just it's just um, you can see some of this propaganda very openly. Uh, so my question essentially is, what, what do you think, uh, what do you think it'll take for uh, social media companies to... Um, take more constructive and um, better action on the, the sort of extremism espoused by uh, Al-Shabaab and other actors in that region. Thank you, Zia. Um, 
Uh, Dr. Halkano, would you like to take on that question first? And then we're going to come back to the one on AI and the implications for uh, terrorism and what we can do. I think we've actually lost Dr. Halkano for a bit. So does any of our panelists want to take the question on uh, artificial intelligence and the implication that it has for terrorism? Well, well Mirad, let me, let, me just, uh, let me just hazard some thoughts and um, uh, do hope that I'll get it right. I, I think that is a very important question by James, extremely very important, uh, in the sense that if you look at the entirety of, of the relevance of technology, whatever form technology have taken, uh, it's always coming in the form of promise and in the form of perils, depending on who masters the strengths and weaknesses early enough, and then adapt it. Uh, for his own uh, strategic objective. I think that the, 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 the growth in artificial intelligence, particularly in the way and manner in it's being used to generate online content now, uh, will have very serious implications for Africa more than any other continent. And the reason is very simple. You know, and I say tell you anywhere I go, you know that uh, terror groups or violent extremist organizations are extremely very powerful. And they are extremely very rich groups. They have a lot of money uh, in their paws. The result, therefore, is that they may begin to pay particular attention on producing new generation of AI jihadists, if I may put it that way. They may be interested in producing a new generation of AI jihadists that will be interested in using online content to promote their um, uh, ideological values, to promote their ideological goals. Now, if they're able to do that, and you can see the speed, that, the speed at which AI can actually accomplish any task given. The question therefore is, is that if Africa is lagging behind and having the needed technological capability to address the basic issues that are not involving the use of AI, then the question would then be, do you think we can also match the speed at which AI is being um, proliferated and uh, propagated and adapted by terrorist groups? My answer would be no. I think that we'll be, we'll be, we'll be coming behind the terrorists rather than being ahead of them. So the implication, therefore, is that terrorist groups can actually use it uh, to generate a lot of fake contents. They are going to use it to generate a lot of fake contents. And when they use it to generate a lot of fake contents, that may likely have serious implications in terms of the confidence people may have on their government. Uh, let's say, for example, uh, they use, uh, they use uh, an AI to generate uh, a, a very uh, a plausible media image suggesting, for example, that the Asorok, which is where the Nigerian president uh, lives, have been attacked. And a lot of persons are going to run with it. And so before the government generates a counter uh, content, so to speak, a counter content to, to, to um, debunk that, it may have a lot of implications for people who do not have the opportunity or the capability to fact check. So I, I think that does have a lot of implications for us. So the first thing we may need to do is to begin to prioritize the capacitation of a special AI command, you know, within the CVE units of African governments. A special AI command that will be deep uh, and forward-looking in its posture to first anticipate a step ahead of the terrorists. Uh, in what ways are they going to use the AI to generate content? And have an already made uh, counter narratives generated with AI to respond should they find out that these terror groups are beginning to deploy that. I think that is very important. Second also is to build the capacity of the people through a lot of enlightenment uh, for them to have capacities to, to fact check, which means therefore that the tools for fact checking is something that has to be built into the educational system of African universities. So that as soon as these ones are en entering the university, at least at the minimum, uh, they should also know how to use these fact checking tools uh, such that and also been training that habit of fact checking anything they see online with some tools. I think that those, those for me will be the immediate response. Uh, I would think that the, the government should need to prioritize, you know, build an AI command to respond to that and also make uh, available in very cheap form uh, um, tools for fact checking and make sure that it's part of the training curriculum uh, for, for universities in Africa. Um, thank you so much for the elaborate explanation. 
Uh, Dr. Halkano, your video is still um, frozen, so I'm not sure if you can hear us and if you would like to take on Zia's question. And if not, uh, probably uh, Professor Anzalon, do you want to uh, jump in on this particular question? Uh, sure. Uh, first, I just just to go to follow up on on, on the AI question. Just I, I would just also note that it's uh, this um, also that it is a very important challenge, and it's something that even uh, I'll just take the United States since I'm here. That it's it's something that that here is an issue as well. This issue of fact checking, getting people to actually make that effort, and I'll just say anecdotally, even you know members of my own family, for example, to have them fact check information before they then send it to you know a mass email list for example you know i have a relative who does that often without fact checking just again as an anecdotal example but it it's one you know that that um, you know speaking with students and speaking uh, you know with with uh, colleagues they have similar you know questions about how do we get because it's something that you know we have to inculcate and train people and educate people to do on their own not not to support a particular you know point of view or or narrative but just if you hear something you know make that extra effort you know especially if it sounds like something you know that that is major news you know let's see what what information is actually available on that and let's see what different you know types of sources are available um, so I'll just say that on that. And on the question about the, uh, Zia's question about the content, I think it, it, it's definitely something that, I think one of the issues though is, is that we saw this even with a group like Islamic State, Islamic State Core. So we'll take moderation and, and finding location of content in Arabic, for example, you know, that there is, first it is, yes, we need people absolutely who have the linguistic abilities to do that. And then we run into the issue of companies run into the issue and governments of just limited personnel. So how do you how do we best do this and prioritize sort of top priorities um, given that most companies and governments will either be unable or unwilling or a combination of both to have adequate staff both so they rely on algorithms. So is there a way then to, to take advantage of some of these you know, emerging technologies, and this is sort of outside of my area, sort of areas of expertise, but to, you know, produce algorithms or other kinds of so automated um, processes that we can better do that. And that's a question, you know, that, that uh, perhaps a possibility. And the fact that Al-Shabaab specifically, you know, what it's been doing for in recent years has been, yes, it has sort of the closed sort of dark web type uh, you know, social media channels, whether that's on Telegram or, or Rocket Chat or, you know, cl closed WhatsApp groups or invitation only WhatsApp groups. But then they also have been posting materials, propaganda materials to Facebook, for example, with the understanding that these accounts will not be live for very long, that they will be shut down and that they don't invest a whole lot of time to build them out. They post them, they or they create them to post certain materials, they know that they're going to be taken down, but they serve their purpose. Because once you know a few copies of that, let's say a video file are available or a print file, then you know people will disseminate them. They can be disseminated by others, right? You don't need the original source, let's say Facebook account page. So I see that Dr. Warrior is back. So I'll, I'll end there, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome back, Dr. Warrior. Thank you so much. There was some technical mis malfunction here on my device, but I'm back on my phone now. So hopefully this works. So there was a question about uh, uh, the role of the artificial intelligence in uh, moderation of uh, social media content. I think this is something that is interesting to be watched over the coming years, because as we know, I, AI is also becoming sophisticatedly uh, accurate in identifying the key uh, terms that often violent extremist group will use. And one of the issues that was also asked was about the Facebook moderation in terms of personnel and so on. Reading the report from Institute for Strategic Dialogue, uh, which was released last year, and it looked at how Al-Shabaab and IS uses uh, social media accounts, especially Facebook, and what that, that really means in terms of moderation. One thing that I think I drew from that report was that uh, because of the large number of materials that are often need to be moderated, the moderators are often given very few, uh, they, they are given a limited amount of time to be able to read or, or listen to these materials. So 
uh, they are given say 15 seconds to just make their point should this go online or offline but often when you look at materials that are produced by al-shabaab or or is immediately starts you can see from the content that these materials are are um, are violent uh, promote a uh, certain form of uh, of of you know very very ideas that are not necessarily sitting with the larger society members so it needs to be it needs to be removed but by and large you will see materials that have, are, are considered to be radical being on facebook for six seven years without it being pulled down but if probably uh the artificial intelligence uh is you know the the, the, the innovation around this is is uh, Goes goes further, it could probably provide us with a with a better way of moderation that is less human. But again, the the, the agency of human beings in understanding contents cannot be replaced by uh, mediated uh, technological innovations like artificial intelligence. I, again, the use of subtle languages that are, are not often identifiable by 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 artificial intelligence means that human agency is very much required in terms of moderation. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Halkano. I think uh, uh, that's something that over time, uh, so many experts in this particular area have raised in relation to um, uh, content regulation. So uh, there are two questions in the chat for uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Frida Monoha. But before that, I would like to say, if anyone has any other commitment, please um, feel free. But it was really great having you around and uh, we really appreciate uh, your contributions. And so the questions for uh, Professor Onwoha, one is on um, following your position that the epicenter of the battle against terrorism is in the mind of the uh, radicalized uh, individual. What are the best approaches to address this particular issue? And the next question, I think, oh, you've already answered that particular question. So uh, over to you. Well, I, I think the, the, it has to do with the way and manner in which governments need to first recognize, because I think solving a problem is first recognizing the source of the problem and then the nature of the problem before you can evolve a response that could address that. I think the very large extent the government have not really realized that the problem lies in the minds of the population that may be vulnerable or that are at risk to radicalization. So once government realizes that, I think the first thing to do is to scale up uh, interventions by government that clearly demonstrates that the government cares for the people. Let's take, for example, the problem of the Boko Haram. You know, it started somehow in the northeastern part of the country. And this is where issues around poverty, issues about unemployment, issues about uh, social destitution was very high. And so the people who were there do not have any sense or feeling of being cared for by the government. And so when violent extremist organizations such as the Boko Haram in its early stages emerged, they decided to create a form of government. I recall very uh, vividly how uh, Mohammed Yusuf started a kind of government within a government. He, he, was, he was issuing loans then to less privileged persons. He, he was supporting women who were traders. We are supporting young persons who were involved in commercial motorcycle with, with, with actually uh, interest-free loans. So by implication, he was responding to the minds of those people about what they need. And so the way the government has to do it is to increase the way and manner in which we address concerns of very vulnerable population. You know, getting to make sure that education is accessible and available to the people. Subsidizing the education, particularly education that has to do with the young persons with the, at, the, at the primary school level, the secondary school level. At those formative age where people's minds are, are actually very, very um, vulnerable to be manipulated easily. I think that's the first thing. Government also needs to come to the aid of these communities that are lacking basic amenities, where, which is where, again, these violent extremist organizations tend to cast a narrative you know, that appeal to the, to the minds and wishes of the people. So if we have a government that is responsive uh, to the challenges of the people in terms of providing social services, education, pipe on water, schools, good roads, I think to a very large extent, government would have burrowed into the minds of these people and would have given these people that sense of belonging. They are part and parcel of the, of the project of that community, so that part and parcel of Nigerian project, if you wish to put it that way. And that is the only way the people will be much more aligned uh, to the government. But where the government says to do this, it has created spaces for these violent extremist, violent extremist organizations 
uh, to plant their own seed. And I can assure you it will germinate. So my response is simple. I will need to prioritize and scale up government intervention uh, in addressing the basic needs of, of the local populations that are at risk. Um, thank you so much. Uh, that's very insightful. And again, it also goes um, to say, like, when the government is trying to address all these issues, they also need to um, uh, come to terms with the nature of policing in the African continent and how uh, we can see from different counterterrorism operations from the east to the west to the south and how policing has a culture of using uh, extreme force. But I think that's a conversation uh, um, uh, that's a conversation that actually needs a workshop of its own. So we have a question from um, uh, uh, BL Steph Stefan, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. And uh, the question is that if there's time for a real quick question, moving from the terrorist content to softer extremist ones, what do experts on the panel, and this goes to everyone on the panel, think about uh, Russian backed African influencers or social media channels? Uh, in their online narratives that promote anti-Western or anti-nationalist sentiments. I'm not sure who wants to uh, take that on, but... Wario, do you want to go first or I should just um, jump in? Yeah, Mar Mario, Mario, you, Mario you, uh, you, uh, you muted yourself. Okay, go, go, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, I, I, I think, and I'm sorry to use the word, I think the question is highly ideological. And I'm, I'm, I don't mean to disrespect the view of whoever that raised that question. That was why I was laughing. You know, I, I, and I'm happy you said moving away from terrorism. So let us move away from terrorism really and move to the space you want us to have a conversation. You know, the, the point is that Africa has become a battlefield uh, for a whole lot of interest. So battlefield between African states and non-state actors like terrorists which we have been discussing uh, in, the, in the past two hours. And then battlefield for, for state and extra-regional actors. And so when I mean state, I mean African states. And then when I mean extra-regional actors, I'm talking about powerful countries that are not of African origin or not African located. And in this context, I will quickly mention the United States, for example, uh, France, Germany, all the colonial masters, and then a bit of China, and then finally Russia. So to your question, it's very simple. Uh, Africa is a beautiful bride in every sense, you know, in terms of the resources they have, and every, and we know this, right? So they are beautiful, bright, have a very good climate, have a lot of resources. In fact, the resources that are going to be very critical uh, in terms of the fourth industrial revolution, when we're talking about the role of AI, uh, um, and then things like electric motor. So as it stands now, all the extra-regional powers uh, know, this in, know, know this in better than I do. They know where these resources are in Africa. And they know that the only way you can get the key to unlocking these resources and um, assessing uh, to, 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 to be modest, but pillaging to be very modern, if I should put it that way, is to make sure that the regime uh, in power or the government in power is your ally. So it is not surprising, therefore, that Russia, uh, by hook or crook, is trying to get a lot of allies in Africa. Um, and where these allies uh, are what? quote unquote, uh, the Western world will think that are, are, are not democratic or people who have as, ascended to power through unconstitutional means in the form of coup d'etat. Uh, we, we then feel that whatever that is coming from those uh, part of Africa uh, is narratives that is against the West. I think every Westerner has every legitimate reasons to think that those narratives is against the West. And every Russian have every reason to believe that those narratives are actually the true narrative. So my concern is where is the African position on this matter? This is where issue of enlightenment uh, is very important so that the Africans themselves will critically, you know, critically query and question uh, narratives that are coming from within and outside Africa to be able to understand whose interests those narratives are promoting and to what extent does those interests promote or hinder uh, Africans' uh, genuine interest. Uh, if, you are, if, you are, if you are a Westerner, you definitely conclude that uh, those narratives coming from Russia, Wagner, and stuff like that are actually oriented against uh, the West. If you are a Chinese, you will be a bit happy because you could see partnership between the Russians and the Chinese. And if you are a, if you are a Russian, you'll be happy that you are gaining grounds in Africa. Talk about Central African Republic, talk about Mali, talk a bit about Burkina Faso. 
again, the heart of the whole of narratives is, is being shared out there. I'm saying that as an African, it's left for us. As a typical non-African, I'm not happy with what West did, the West did with Libya. You may not like it, but if you are if you're a Westerner, then you understand where I'm coming from. Uh, because in the context of what happened in Libya, it was only Russia that was against the resolution in 1972, which talked about no-fly zone, which was the pretext for the removal of Muammar Gaddafi. We don't have an African leader that is going to heaven. Let's just put it that way. None of African leaders are going to heaven. But some of them, we prefer them that have chaos. So we have chaos now in Libya, and the whole of Sahel region is almost being destabilized. People will tell you now they would have preferred Gaddafi to be there than we having the experience we are having now. And so we're already descending into another problem in South Sudan. So the question therefore is, who and who is behind the crisis going on in Africa? And who is framing the narrative around this crisis to his own interest? My argument is that it depends on where you are standing. But as a true African, I think we need to be very, very dispassionate about this. To say that these ex extraditional forces are all pushing their interest. It depends on how and the way and manner in which we can garner our own authentic African voices uh, to be able to uh, decode these narratives and, and respond to those narratives uh, to, to, to protect our interests. But for me, everybody is in the battlefield of winning uh, their interests in Africa. And narratives are very critical to doing that. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Umoha. Dr. Wario, would you like to jump in on that as well? There's nothing much to add after a wonderful presentation, I mean, explanation from uh, 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 Professor Freedom. But I think we need to just put in the perspective that there is a lot of ideological pull between the West and uh, Russia and China on one side, and Africans are all the time meant to choose one over the other. And this really puts a big strain on relation between African countries and other countries across the world. But again, that aside, uh, we, we should also see how much Russia's influence is growing in, in the African continent. Uh, Wagner, which is a, a proxy uh, militia group, uh, mercenary group for the Russian uh, regime is active in Sudan, is acting in Central Africa, Central Africa Republic, and this is in, in gold mining uh, and other forms of mining. It's, it's very active in, in Mali, in Burkina Faso. And therefore we should not also disconnect between other forms of non-state violent actors from the conflicts in African continent. And, and this really plays into the larger security infrastructure in Africa. And, and probably the classic example is what's happening in, in the Sudan right now with, uh, with, with, with between uh, the RSF and, and the military regime. And of course the civilians are, are losing out because the larger pol political powers, the ge geopolitical interests across the world is largely affecting how people are uh, looked at on, on the region. But by and large, I think we need to mention that uh, non-state militarized actors from Russian origin are very much active as part of the larger conflict uh, infrastructure in the West, in the Sahel, in, in, in the Horn, especially in Sudan, but not necessarily the Horn of Africa, Somalia, Kenya. This, this region has not have had this kind of presence at the moment. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wario. Professor Anzalon, did you have anything to add on that particular question? I, I would just uh, sort of in, sort of emphasize the same things that my colleagues have. Um, I mentioned also sort of the a more nuanced view. It's something this is a personal view, but but that rather than you know that there is a tendency, I think, um, in certain circles to see uh, as Dr. Anoha very eloquently put put out in detail, you know, explained in detail that to sort of take out sort of African perspectives and African voices from this, that it's Africa is just a place of competition for China, the United States and Russia. And then, you know, maybe other countries, France or Britain or, you know, and that there is not, uh, sometimes there's not enough understanding or, or, or focus on, you know, domestic and regional sort of dynamics and voices. So the fact that what's happening in Sudan, what's happening in Mali, uh, when, when, you know, with the, the end of the French uh, operations in Mali, Barkhan, that, that uh, this is something that was created in Moscow or in some other capital, as opposed to that it is, you know, there are domestic and regional reasons that these things have happened. And that, yes, there are many foreign sort of uh, both sort of superpower or, and also regional, you know, I think we should mention also uh, the United Arab Emirates, for example, um, or some of the Arab Gulf countries that are also very active. And this I think is more of, the case, of a case in, in not only in Libya, but also in the Horn and in other places. Um, and then the second thing I would just add to, the, um, to what my colleague said is that this, there's also an interaction between these different types of non-state 
armed actors. So for example, in the Sahel, we've seen with the presence of Wagner that the jihadist organizations, both the Al-Qaeda affiliated ones uh, like JNIM uh, and, and also Islamic State in the Sahel, Sahel province, uh, so-called, um, have been emphasizing Wagner's presence. That, so they've added Wagner as one of these, you know, uh, as part of the conspiracy against the, the Sahelian Muslims, basically. And that they can say, oh, we're also attacking, you know, the Russian imperialists or the, you know, crusaders as well. So they've added both the Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State affiliates in the Sahel, for example, have added Wagner as one of the, the kind of reasons that they are uh, active. So I would just add those uh, short things. Uh, thank you so much for highlighting on the uh, multi-actor nature of the issue, but also how it's so multidimensional and that you can't just um, look at it as a case of um, Africa versus Russia or Africa versus the West. So uh, thank you so much. I have one final question, but in case you don't have the time, it's also okay. But my question is actually um, based on, uh, given the nature of, of uh, this particular issue of online extremism and, and us having, as, the, as a continent, we have different strategies within the countries, but we also have um, uh, regional organizations and, and as well as a continental organization that is the African Union. How do we um, sort of try to synchronize all these strategies in, in, in a strategy within the regional body or a strategy at the AU level that actually has this online angle, because you can actually see uh, the online dimension of extremism being identified by, the, by these different actors. But at the same time, when it comes to featuring on say uh, national strategies, including Kenya's own national strategy, there's a very little component of it. So you're actually left wondering if we've identified it as a dimension, then what are we doing? Like it shouldn't need to come out as an add-on, Rather, it should be part and parcel of the strategies as a whole. I'm not sure who wants to take that on. Okay, I'll, I'll go uh, quickly. I think uh, I, I, in, in, we have the regional, we have the national strategy in Kenya. We have the IGAD strategy for the Horn of Africa countries. I think there is also the inspiration drawn from the United Nations Secretary General's plan of action to prevent violent extremism. By and large, Africa Union, I think may also have some uh, PCV strategy, but again, my, my, my key point when I'm always looking at the policy dimension of addressing the problem of violent extremism, especially the online one is the implementation bit. We have very beautiful documents that are often made and this of, these documents are often made with assistance from development actors, uh, whether it is USAID or DFID or EU funded programming around this. But then it, it boils down on the individual country's ability to be able to address disinformation using the mechanism that they have in force. So often a lot goes behind the policy because there are, if we, I take the, the case of Kenya, there is the communication authority, there is the national intelligence service, there is the national, Center for uh, National Center for Counterterrorism, NCTC. So there's multiple agencies that are already dealing with uh, disinformation control, which is not necessarily reflected in the in the national strategy or or the EGAD strategy. So we have we have multiple uh, state agencies that are already dealing with this. At the same time, we have the national strategy that aspires to address the online dimension of it. So while on, on the policy level, it doesn't, the, the, the national strategy doesn't necessarily look as if it's addressing the online presence. There is a whole layer of multi-agency organizations, state formations that are dealing with that. Then that also brings the question that was, uh, the, the point that was raised by Freedom about uh, the dichotomy, I mean, the, 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 the move between security and civil liberty, because we give state institutions that are lying outside the purview of the general public understanding on how they can access people's information all the time. And this information can be used also for controlling political dissent, uh, dissidents, and so on and so on. But again, I think we it will have been interesting or even important if the AU, for instance, pushed certain continental understanding of how to do the online moderation or how to deal with the issues of disinformation at continental level and aspire that 
members accept some form of um, tri treaties on, or, or, or some form of regulation on the same and being applied across. But, but regionally, I think it is easy to do that than at the continental level because agreements are not easy to make at, at, at that larger level. That's my, my own take. Probably someone can add some more ideas. Yes, just a quick one. I think, I think uh, Dr. Wario, you are absolutely correct. It, it will be very difficult to have that kind of uh, continent-wide uh, strategy. Again, you, you know, it's because of the differences at the regional level. Uh, political, uh, historical, linguistics, and otherwise. But I think that what could be uh, done is really for the AU, for instance, to be at the driving seat, you know, of looking forward to some of these issues, mirage that we have raised. For example, the question about the AI, you know, what is the implication of AI adaptation by terrorists or violent groups for Africa as a continent? I think that if uh, AU is at the forefront of the, the, the knowledge production. One thing that could come out is to, is to commission a continent-wide um, best practice study, you know, a, a, a continent best practice study that could then look at the different approaches, national approaches that have been adopted in the last five or 10 years or, or 15 years to deal generally with the issues of online uh, extremism and then use it as a basis you know, to generate some best practices in ways that you can then balance the imperative of national security pursuits and the people's civil liberty. Because I think the more we go into a technology-driven world, uh, the more we are going to have this challenge about, you know, how do you neatly um, demarcate the, the, the line, you know, separating uh, national security in terms of surveillance and monitoring and operation, and then, and then uh, civil liberty in terms of people's enjoyment to, to, to uh, the human rights. So I think at the continent level, maybe a best practice uh, study commissioned at a continent-wide level may produce a resource that, that could at least serve as a continental uh, forward-looking document that will influence you know, the national strategy. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Unoha and Dr. Wario. I'm not sure if Professor Nzalon wants to add anything to that. Uh, no, uh, I think they covered it very well. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it's always important to remember how it's not a clear-cut process and that uh, regulation in one area could actually mean uh, the infringement of rights in another area. So uh, thank you so much for the amazing insights. And uh, it was really um, great to have you as a panel and to just have you share uh, your knowledge and expertise on the issue. Like I said at the beginning of the workshop, we rarely have opportunities where we have um, voices from Africa talking about violent extremism and what we can do uh, from now onwards. So it was really um, great to have such an amazing panel and very diverse as well. So uh, thank you so much for everything. And uh, uh, we look forward to seeing you in more VoxPol events in the future. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.